Hello, fellow youth, and welcome to a back to school special by yours truly. Okay, I realize we are actually several months away from the start of back to school season, and we are now approaching the full blown panic of midterm mode. But I thought I'd put together some of my favorite science backed study tips for you guys to help you prepare for your exams. And to help us get through all of these, I have brought on a lovely friend. You've been hit by a smooth Hi, Patrick Kelly, who has his own channel, and we're gonna be working together to bring you some science-backed study tips. Let's do this. So my number one tip, and I'm putting it right at the top here because I think it's the most important one, is to learn how to take the test. I know this sounds nuts, but I think even more important than learning the actual information that will be on the test, you need to learn how to take it. So what do we mean by this? Have you ever sat down to take an exam and flipped to the first question and the first question is something that you haven't prepared the material for and you're like, well, that's okay, it's gonna be fine. I'll just flip to the end and then go back to all of the ones that I didn't answer because I didn't know them. And then you get to the end of the test and you haven't answered any of the questions because you haven't prepared for any of the material that's on the exam. That's what I'm talking about. When I took zoology in college, the professor had a really distinct exam style. So for his questions, he would ask us to draw the mechanism of action for a system or a process, like calcium ion channels and how muscles fire. And then you had to draw out and label all of the pieces and write a short answer explaining how it all worked. And if I had ignored the way this professor structured his exams and just studied the way that I thought I should in some sort of arbitrary way and focused on like rote memorization, then I would have been way less prepared to answer the questions on his exams and I wouldn't have practiced drawing the processes like I would have to do on the exam and I wouldn't have done as well in the class as I did. I think it's a good incentive too to show up to class. Oh my God, right? huge. Like if you just got a Quizlet or an Anki deck or something, Anki, Anki, I don't know, the, the flashcards. If you just relied on that, you wouldn't have known that that professor loves to use that style. So another good example of this is like studying for standardized tests. There's a reason that the SAT, the ACT, and even the GRE all have prep books. And there's like courses that you can buy and it's because these exams have a very specific style and formula that dictate what success is mm -hmm. and it's specific to that exam. So you could be a really you know, talented math student. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't tested in that particular style of test and know the materials, you might not do as well as somebody who is like so-so in math, but they could go to all the test preps and they put a lot of work into that mm -hmm. style of preparation because these things do have such a strict format. I have dyscalculia, which is sort of like, dyslexia for numbers in some in some senses. So like I'm clinically bad at math. And it wasn't because I was any better or worse at the material that I did really well on the SAT. It's only because my parents paid for a preparatory course. I spent like 10 weeks learning how to do those questions, the specific way that they would be asked and practicing those specific skills. And this is just one of many reasons why things like college entrance exams are a discriminatory hurdle to higher education. Because again, my my higher score was not a reflection of my intelligence, it was a reflection of me being able to afford not only the exam itself, but also the resources and support to prepare for it. The tea is exceptionally good today. Anyway, that's tip number one. Familiarize yourself with the requirements of that exam. Get to know your professor. Don't be scared to talk to them. That's so valuable. Get mm -hmm. to know the other students in your class. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Like asking questions doesn't make you stupid. It will let you know how the exam will be structured, what material will be covered, because you will never know until you ask. And knowing the nature of the exam itself is the first and most important part of knowing what materials to prepare for the exam. So once you familiarize yourself with how the questions will be asked, you can now do a better job of preparing your responses. So just how do you synthesize a whole quarter or whole semester of terms worth of material into concise answers that you can just pull out on command? Our answer to that <laughs> is tip number two. Just do a little bit every day. We could also call this repetition, repetition, repetition. And it's funny because I'm repeating the uh, word. I see what you did there. We're right, we're professionals. <laughs> Just to get a little technical here, there are actually three recognized stages of learning, and that's acquisition, consolidation, and recall. 
Pretty simple, right? So to keep from being too overwhelmed by that mid or end of term exam, it can be really helpful to use a stepwise approach to note taking. And that gives you enough time for all of these three steps. So if there's preparatory reading to be done before class, I like to try and do as much of that as possible. And that involves not only sitting down and reading through as much of it as you can, because let's be real, we're all busy, but also taking little notes in the margins and noting down any questions you might have or points that stick out out to you that really stick in your brain. And then in class, you can take notes on the lecture, the questions that you had, the discussion that's happening, any comments or questions or strong points from yourself or your fellow classmates. I always thought the reading was like a voluntary homework. Like, hey, just yep. so you know, class, this is what we're gonna be talking about. Suggested. And then you get the professor who was just like, sweet, now that you all know what we're talking about because you did the reading last and night. And you're like, slow it down, bud, I don't yeah. know what's going on. <laughs> and these notes that you take in class or beforehand can be really messy. Like my brain is all over the place. It's very spur of the moment, especially when trying to like get everything down in class. Hard to believe. <laughs> My handwriting's really messy, and so they're not pretty to look at in this phase, but this is all of the acquisition phase of learning. You're taking that new information and introducing it to your brain for the first time. Pause for a quick second. It's better to take notes digitally or by hand. Mm. So for most people, taking notes while typing is faster. Makes sense. I'm not a good typist though, that's not true for me. <laughs> that's fine. Research indicates that when you're writing your notes out by hand, you actually retain more of the information. Oh, thank God. It's because you can't do it as fast, so you can't write as much, so you're forced to pick and choose what to write. Okay, so yeah. there's like a little conscious processing there. Exactly. Okay. That extra processing cements the information into your brain more effectively for retrieval later, but mm. you can get more information down for thinking about later if you can transcribe more of it through typing. So like, what are you supposed to do? So I feel like this is where this tip comes in handy because, you know, like take notes whichever way you feel most comfortable and whichever way makes you feel like you're absorbing the most information during class or before for that acquisition phase. But then the main part of this tip is to always come back to them later that same day or as soon as you can, again, we're all busy to really cement that information in place. Like I like to have a separate notebook that I call my exam prep notebook, where I take all of those, as we mentioned, extremely messy notes and the highlighted bits and questions from the reading, plus, you know, my equally messy and garbled and out of order notes and questions from lecture and any additional stuff that's all scattered all over my room as per usual, and put them all together in a much more organized and neat way. And this allows me to synthesize all of that information into a cohesive whole, not only on paper, but also in my brain. Like you can make connections between all of the different bits. You can have fun with it. You can organize the structure and flow of the information in a logical way. You can do it in a way that makes sense to you personally, drawing flow charts and maps, using different colors, being really creative. And all of this is allowing your brain to create a network of information that's really solidly anchored in place in your brain. And you'll be able to come back to it later, even if you're not looking at your notes. So this is that consolidation mm -hmm. phase where the knowledge is becoming becoming stable and finding a firm foothold in your brain. And it's kind of like building a house, like the more structure you give it to hang onto, the more likely that knowledge is gonna be able to stay in place. It might seem like a huge pain in the butt to take notes every day, It does right? a little bit, it can feel frustrating. <laughs> Here is what I love. There's this technique called space repetition, which is gonna involve like both spacing and repetition. Oh, really? I know, right. Okay, Graphic. the repetition. Morals for spring. Groundbreaking. Here's the idea. You have a concept or a chapter that you're studying for with a bunch of different topics in it. Some of those topics are easy. Some of them are more complicated. The easier ones, you don't have to study as often. Sure, that makes the sense. The more complicated ones, you're gonna need either like daily work to understand wholly, mm -hmm. or it's so new to you that you're gonna have to repeat it more and more so that you can understand it in its complexity. On one hand, you could just study an entire deck of flashcards. Mm -hmm. Why do that when you could study the easy stuff less often and put more time and attention into the harder stuff? Some people will do like, all right, I have my daily cards, I have my every three day cards, oh my I have my every week cards. And some people that are already studying for the final are like, all right, sweet, I've got this stuff from the first month of the semester ready to go and I'm Ooh. studying it once a month. You can do all that, but either way, it's a nice reminder that you don't have to do every bit, every line item, everything from your glossary 
every day. Right. So my third tip is to be able to find the story and tell it. And this may sound kind of weird for sciencey people in particular, but the power of narrative is universal for every subject, and I promise you it's gonna come in really handy. For example, Meredith and I have both studied for and passed remind you, <laughs> passed the personal Success. trainer exam. Yes, <laughs> in different, in different uh, boards, but we both passed. This involved being able to call on a huge body of knowledge, like literally There's so much material bodies of knowledge <laughs> about muscles and bones. You're welcome. So in the human body, how can you use all these different modalities to strengthen and repair bodies? And how can you use that info when people are injured? Mm -hmm. There's a ton of things to know. Right. So there's no way that you could just remember like dot, 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 because there's $50,000. It's not like a list you can memorize. It's not a deck of cards or like uh, vocab words that you can memorize. Like that's just not gonna work for an exam like that. Right. So instead of trying to memorize, say a list of all the muscles in the body, I would come up with an example client or like yourself or a friend, something in your real life, something concrete that you already have an emotional attachment to. And that's important because emotions will heighten any network in your brain that they're attached to and make it easier to remember information that's tied to emotions. So say, I'm friends with Pat. Pat makes me really happy. I'm gonna Aww. say to myself, if I'm studying for the personal trainer exam, Pat wants to run a marathon. I don't, never, absolutely not. I mean, hypothetically, if he were to do that, what muscle groups would be under stress? What exercises could he do to strengthen the muscle groups in his lower body? And be able to pull out the names of those muscles that way, instead of trying to remember this list divorced from my real life. Yeah, so an example of that, Back in undergrad, I had to take a pharmacology class. This is like the study of drugs and drug actions. And this was mostly about learning about over-the-counter drugs. Mm -hmm. We're not talking like something you would get injected into you in the you doctor's know, like office. Aspirin. Yeah. So that's one of those classes that sounds like it should be strictly memorization. Mm. Here's a list of drugs, mm -hmm. here's a list of what they do, right? This drug does this, as opposed to building a narrative. So mm. it seems like the most counterintuitive example. It worked fine for the first couple weeks, like the memorization strategy, but then we had to start solving case studies, mm. right? You have patient X that has is presenting with this or whatever. Mm -hmm. So when I was solving these, I had to construct a story of the patient. So at that point, I had already had some assessment classes. I went to school for like physical therapy, kinesis, sports medicine as a so background. Cool. I never said that on camera, so that's like a thing now. Oh, nice. Yeah, a like intro. I don't think my own audience actually knows that. <laughs> so like with pharmacology, what I could do instead was, this is what the patient is presenting with. Mm -hmm. I have an idea in my head of like, okay, that injury or that illness is caused by this underlying physiology. Mm. Then I can find the drug that matches what would correct or alter that physiology. And so instead of going from like, this patient needs this drug, I was able to go like beginning, middle, end, as opposed to just having a beginning and an end. Right, this whole network between connecting points. And I feel like that brings together all of our tips. So Patton knew that his professor was gonna ask for case studies yep. to solve case studies on the exam. So that's how he prepared. He also was able to connect different points of his learning in his notes as he prepared. And then to really cement it in so that he could recall that information, step three of learning, he was able to tie it into this story yep. aspect. Yeah, you got it. Hi, my dudes. I'm just finishing up the edit on this one. It's almost ready to be uploaded. And I just wanted to let you know that Pat and I had a couple of bonus tips here at the end that we wanted to include, but I didn't want to make this video incredibly long. Like it's already pretty long, but I didn't want to make it even longer. So I've put those together into a little IGTV video, which you can find on my Instagram profile. I'm at Marin B on Instagram and Pat is at Pat Kelly teaches. And so you can find our, our extra supplementary bonus tips over there. Um, I think they're really helpful and handy on like a day-to-day -day basis. So go ahead and check those out if you're interested. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really hope it's helpful. And if you end up using any of the tips, please let me know down in the comments below. Pat and I have actually worked together on something else. Yeah, so we did a video for my channel that's all about the kinesiology of gait which is just walking, but of course it's a lot more complicated than just one foot in front of the other. And I decided to use your expertise as a fitness and running person to get that one done. So come check it out. It's a lot more complicated than you might think. Thank you so much, Pat, for Thank helping you. me explain all of this fun brain stuff. Subscribe to this channel and to Pat's for more awesome videos like this, and we will see you next time. Stay nerdy.